Professor Stephen Ullenbrock, he has a great CV. He, uh, he started since November 2015, um, coordinator of the UNESCO World Water Assessment Program, WAP, and the director of the UNESCO Program Office on Global Water Assessment in Perugia, Italy. Uh, between 2000 and 2014, he held different positions at UNESCO IHE, Professor of Hydrology, and then he became the Deputy Director or the Vice Rector at DSA in IHE. And then um, he became the Director or Acting Rector between 2014 and 2015. He did his PhD in 1999 and habilitation, which is what is after the PhD, is 2003 at the University of Freiburg. Freiburg is one of the very good universities in water in Germany. He is also a professor for exper experimental hydrology at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands since 2009. Uh, professor Ullenbrock's main expertise includes water assessment, hydrological process research, river basin modeling, and water resources management. Stefan is involved in supporting member states in achieving the sustainable development goals and actually this is the main core of his presentation. Please join me to welcome him. Good evening. I have your cell phone with the, with the timer on by the way. <laughs> it's the 50 minutes. No. Thank you. Thank you. Your Excellency, Minister Ahmed Abdel Alti, uh, Minister Amikor, Professor Nacken, Professor Zamia, Ms. Kirsten. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here this, uh, this evening and uh, speak a little bit about the SDGs. And what I would like to do in the next 15 minutes is to explain achieving the SDGs. I, I do a lot of work, I'm involved in a lot of work at the global scale, but then also to think about with you, what does that mean to actually, from this global assessment, to break that down to action at the, at the national scale? So I will, I, I put in some, a couple of examples from some countries, particularly Egypt, where we are here today. Uh, and I tried to, to make that link between the global assessments uh, triggering national action. I base it on, on two sources of knowledge. The one is the um, SDG 6 so-called synthesis report, a report that we launched uh, two months ago at the HLPF uh, in New York. It's a UN water report and while I'm presenting I really would like to acknowledge the contribution of, of many, many colleagues who contributed to that. You see here the agencies at the bottom and it's really the, the output of, of a collaborative effort uh, of the UN family producing this report, report and informing the member states where are we with this SDG SDG 6, you know, with the different indicators, how far are we with reaching the targets, what are the interlinkages between water and all the other SDGs, what are the key policy recommendations that we have to speed up, to really increase the pace in achieving this important goal. Um, the second, uh, while I prepared for this lecture, I, I, I found two, uh, there's many interesting reports from the region and from Egypt, but I found two quite striking uh, documents, uh, which is the, the SDG 6 um, indicator report by uh, Egypt, done by the leadership of uh, Professor Al um, uh, Abdel Alti, uh, Minister Abdel Alti, as well as the, the 2030 vision of Egypt. And I will refer back to that from this global assessment that we did. We have 17 main messages in this report, and I just want to share five with you because it's already 8 o'clock in the evening. So, first message. Achieving SDG 6 is absolutely critical for making progress in all the water, other SDGs. So water is critical for energy security, food security, reducing poverty, health, climate change, gender equality, etc., etc., and vice versa. Making progress in all the other fields is absolutely critical making, for making progress in water. In water. Um, this is maybe not so new to you. These interlinkages are built in, you know, by design of the agenda. But uh, what does that mean for implementing SDG 6? Does that mean if we want to achieve a better health, we need to invest in water? And the other way around, if we want to invest in, in water, we, as, as a co-benefit, you might want to argue we, we can supply people with cleaner water, reduce uh, health costs, reduce um, uh, the resilience of society, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but what does it mean for implementing in terms of setting the priority rights to understand these interlinkages is absolutely critical for, for coming up with coherent policies. 
The value of water, I, I think the, uh, Her Excellency from Singapore, she already explained that it's not only about the cost for providing the water services, no? it's also about having the cost for continuously improving, for uh, continuously being able to invest in it, but also having uh, the, the other co-benefits of that water service are absolutely critical. So, so valuing water right is, is uh, going much further than, than the economic cost that we have for the provision service. And finally, um, also in, in that kind of interlinkages uh, aspect, I would like to say um, to really enter that so-called virtuous cycle, as the uh, World Bank always likes to um, call it. I mean, a reinforcement of cycle where a better service then also leads to certain benefits increasing then also the revenue stream for further increasing the benefits. Uh, would require that some feedback by benefits that we get through the water investment also goes back into the investment of water. Yeah. How does it, how does it look like at local scale? And I, I'm now coming back to this interlink to the um, Egyptian vision and uh, as it is done in, in many countries, Egypt made that decision to, to look at um, the vision for 2030 from a societal environmental dimension. I think I have nothing to add when it comes to environmental dimension. I think it was an impressive presentation by His Excellency Minister Abdel El Arti. But I would like to say a few words about the economic division. And if I look at this document, uh, these were examples for projects for economic development for Egypt. And they were just listening there, and uh, it shows that. Uh, his Excellency seems to be a close friend of the Minister of, uh, of Economic Affairs in Egypt because if, if I look to them and I just try to classify them in terms of what are water projects, I make them dark blue, and, and indirect water projects. So the direct water projects are the, related to Suez Canal, water demand management, water quality management, improving uh, fisheries, uh, etc., etc., uh, river transportation. These are directly water related. A project for economic development of Egypt. Furthermore, we have a number of projects uh, that are indirectly related water, like the, the, the Golden Triangle for, mi for mining reads a lot of water supply and sanitation man and uh, uh, wastewater management. If you look about the uh, uh, new capital city or other cities, the El Oreb Robeki uh, Leather City, I'm sorry for mispronouncing that, has a lot of careful thinking about water security in the city as well as wastewater management for the leathering, manufacturing, and processing. Um, uh, agricultural, agro industry establishing for uh, health centers, etc., has a lot of water linkages. So, so it really shows that par excellence in this country how water is directly linked to economic development in the country. Second message, inequalities are at the all-time high. While there has been a lot of success during the MDG phase, during the period 2000 to 2015, we have never been in a world where, where there's so, un, uh, so unequal access to a number of services, including water. What we plot here is the GDP on the x-axis versus the um, access to safe, safety managed drinking water. Every country is a bubble. The size of the bubble is the number of people. And you see the higher income countries have a much better service. And on the y-axis, you can plot safety managed sanitation or a number of other parameters. The pattern is often the same. Um, if you look at the safety managed, excuse me, um, the, the basic drinking water services, which is uh, a, a parameter that was developed during the MDG phase. We, you see this global map and you see the blue areas are doing fine. Seven out of ten people have access to at least basic water, but there are still 844 million who do not have access, even not to basic water. There's 2.5 million not having access to safely drink, drinking water managers, uh, um, safely managed drinking water. So it's very, very uh, serious still and it still needs a lot of investment. Looking at two countries for, for nationalizing that perspective a bit further, I, I just picked, a, we, we did that analysis for a, a couple of countries along the, the Nile Basin, and, and I'll show you tonight some, some examples from uh, Egypt as well as from Ethiopia. And uh, just to remind us, the, 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 um, the Egyptians and the people in the room know that very well, the, the uh, population density is, is in Egypt very, very special because of the uh, geographic situation, and you see it here uh, on this map. And in Ethiopia, you see much more distributed 
population. So if, we, if I now show results for different government rates, uh, please keep in mind that w where the people are, are living in, in these two different countries because that's important for the interpretation. If you look at uh, basic water, uh, Egypt, more than, far more than 90% have actually piped water into the dwelling. Uh, a smaller percentage do not have pipe water and you see either to the uh, neighborhood, to the yard or, or located elsewhere. In Ethiopia it's a different situation where unfortunately only a relatively small percentage has directly uh, pipe water to the uh, dwelling directly. If you look at also this on, on a map, pipe water, you see how, how different the situation within the country can be. So just having a percentage of a country is not informing policy processes very well. So therefore I was also happy to see, uh, hear this um, earlier today when the minister explained that for every governorate there's a different approach improving uh, service level really tailored towards the different needs. Also, when it comes to uh, having access in uh, less than, excuse me, more than 30 minutes uh, to, to collect the water, you see that in Egypt there's a lot of green colors. Egypt, uh, by Ethiopia, it's, it's a different pattern and you see some areas, even also in Egypt where, where we have longer, uh, where a larger percentage of the society needs, to, needs, needs a bit longer to, to collect the water. While the situation in Egypt is, is uh, for a uh, uh, lower middle income country, very good compared to other lower middle income countries. Um, yeah, uh, that's I need to say. Coming back to uh, the other part of WASH, though, the uh, sanitation, and I was speaking about inequalities. And uh, globally, we see that some 70% of the world have act has access to basic sanitation. Take Latin America. And uh, we see that everything between 30 and 100 percent is in Latin America. Take Panama, our fa fairly industrialized um, part of Latin America. So you see on average it's 80 percent, but you have everything between 100 and 80 percent within this relatively small country of Panama. And there's a huge difference between the urban and the rural, the rich and the poor, and different municipalities of Panama. So it, it demonstrates how critically important it is to look at the, the variability at the sub-national scale to really be informed uh, to, to make right policies uh, for the country and not just looking at the global, global parameters. All right, quickly uh, for Egypt. Uh, you see different types of sanitation. Um, here is every governorate of one uh, column, but obviously there's a, uh, the, the population density is different. And I was very happy also this morning to see um, Egypt is, is critically investing in many things, including sanitation, as we learned earlier today. But also there's, I think, a new project for, uh, which is co-financed by the World Bank with some 300 million, was on the headline news today on the Egypt Daily, um, I think, signed today. So the big investments also for rural sanitations to, to uh, make make this pattern more, more equal is, is uh, certainly a, a very good step in the, in the right direction. Uh, open defecation, less of a problem in, in this specific region, but uh, globally it, it is still there. And the objective is to end open defecation by 2030. It has not only to do with the health of people, it has also to do with the dignity and with the, with the, with the safety, in particular for female uh, in, in this situation. If we look at the last 15 year, we, years, we see a clear decrease of open defecation rates in different parts. The, the largest burden is in uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as in Central and Southern Asia. You see the, the values going down. But, uh, you know, if they, they line quite nicely up, and, and if there's a, on, a, on a PowerPoint interpolation, what I, what I was able to only do quickly, you can see, if you, if you extrapolate linearly, you can clearly see that, um, particularly in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as in uh, Southern, and Eastern, uh, Southern and Central Asia, we will not end open defecation. It will not be zero. So therefore, we really need to speed up the effort. Also, if you look at the countries where we do not have basic water supply, only four out of, uh, only one out of five countries on track. If you look at the countries who not have basic sanitation, only one out of 10 countries is on track if we extrapolate from the past 15 years for the future. So we really have to reinforce the pace. We really have to reinforce the speed to achieve these goals. Time to act is really now. Um, I skipped this quickly on the interest of time and quickly on a few words on, on water resources. I was speaking about wash indicators so far. Um, globally, we, we, seen, we, we see water uh, demand uh, escalating, although the withdrawal rates over time have been increasing, but less than 70% nowadays go to agricultural use. 
um, a bit, some 12% some to the domestic water and some 19% roughly to uh, industry and energy. So this, this number of uh, like 70 or 69% going into agriculture is globally right. Um, however, if you look at the different continents, we see a complete different picture and you see that in Europe, it's only 21% of the total withdrawals going into irrigation, while more than 50% go into agriculture and industry. Excuse me, to agriculture and energy. It's a bit late already, excuse me. Um, energy and industry. So, so biggest water savings are there, while in more agricultural-based economies, in some of them, more than 90% of the withdrawals go into agriculture. Biggest savings obviously are in this sector, and these savings can be achieved by, by fully utilizing latest technology uh, that, that makes savings of the water available also for other uses. But we will hear more about that in the next three, four days of the conference. I've seen a number of session, sessions addressing this part. The chair is looking at me carefully, and I'm coming to the last part of my, of my presentation. I would like to speak briefly about financing. Um, I was uh, earlier this um, on, on Thursday. I was at a meeting at the European Investment Bank, and it, it was quite striking. A total cost for achieving the SDGs was estimated to 2,500 billion, so 2.5 trillion U.S. dollars per year of investment needed to achieve the total SDGs. And I was then involved in a session on financing water, and and, and the conclusion was: How much is needed for water? We don't know. So uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to come up with, with a number because of all these co-benefits and interdependencies. So we, we cannot really give a number. Why is this needed? Um, just looking at what is more than 80% of the society, what do they pay for water and what the remaining 20% uh, of the society pay for water. And for instance, in this part of Northern Africa and Western Asia, there's still uh, more than 3% of the society who pay more than 3% of the domestic income for wash services in total, yeah? which, which, uh, which can be significant, particular for the so-called bottom of the pyramid people. So therefore, my, my last slide on financing. Uh, globally, costs are enormous. There's different numbers. Uh, one estimate is 500 billion per year in terms of costs. The World Bank estimated just for WASH, it was uh, an, an uh, investment need of some 114 billion per year is estimated, but this does not even include operation and maintenance costs. So the real cost is much higher than this 114. And, and other, in, uh, other water investment costs are, are not included. Some 80% out of a survey of some 104 countries, I guess, uh, say that they do not have enough financing to, to achieve the national wash targets. And if we look globally on the ODA part, which is particular for the uh, uh, low developing world and an important source still, um, while globally ODA has been uh, increasing over the past years and tripled in agriculture, uh, for wash it has remained rather constant and some regions even declined. Um, there, therefore, the last uh, points I would like to make to really enter to that, that paradigm shift that is needed for financing uh, the water sector. Um, the, the report concluded that we first need to fully effectively utilize existing financial resources that needs innovations, innovations also in finance. Second, the full socioeconomic value of water needs to be considered. UNICEF published this number, every dollar put into the wash sector pays back for society with factor five, including all the uh, macroeconomic benefits that, uh, that are there. So we really need to consider this in, in uh, economic models or finance models need to develop more to full, uh, more comprehensive uh, economic models. To do that, we need an enabling environment that is able to utilize a number of different financial resources including a so-called blended financing setup, which has uh, domestic uh, money, but also international private financing, commercial financing um, is absolutely needed. To do that, we need an enabling environment for that investments. Mind you, most of the water investments, and I think that was clearly illustrated by, by His Excellency, the, the Minister, uh, showing that it needs a lot of upfront capital investment and then quite a long payback period over time, and this speciality of these water investment needs need, need a proper risk management to be to able to, to utilize also uh, international and, and commercial financing. To do that, a number of reforms are necessary. 
This is were the five messages I would like to uh, wanted to share with you this evening. I hope at the uh, time of the day this was still digestible, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much.